Welcome to the Football Show on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. I'm Peter Martin, Alan Ruff, Neil Lennon and Tam McManus are with me here on the show and here's what we're going to be talking about. Steve Clark admits Scotland players moved on quicker from the defeat to the Netherlands than he did ahead of tomorrow night's friendly against Northern Ireland. I think they've had to pick me up. I tend to sulk a little bit longer than they do. Scott McTominay reveals he has high hopes for Scotland, with the midfielder vowing this squad can be history makers at this summer's Euros. We want to be the most successful Scottish team in history to, to, to go there and, and show that we can do it. Hearts have hit out at Rangers for defacing their club badge after pictures circulated online showing Nybrook's club's crest covering the Jambos emblem on the home dressing room floor. Former England manager Sven Goran Eriksson has revealed that managing Liverpool against Ajax legends at Anfield at the weekend was a dream come true. Uh, even when I had England, I, I was a supporter of Liverpool, but I couldn't say it at that time. That wouldn't have been <laughs> very good. Yeah, lots to talk about. International <laughs> football dominates our thoughts. Should we read too much into a 4-0 loss to the Netherlands, Ruffy? No, uh, the result obviously wasn't positive at all. There were parts of the game that were positive, but at the end of the day, uh, it was a heavy defeat that the players will have to get their, their act together. It does, when we're winning, you know, we love throwing up stats of nine games undefeated. Now people are throwing up stats of we've not won a game for eight games. So I think there were parts of the games that looked good. I like the midfield got forward, you know, and supported Shankland up front. But I think, I thought we'd sorted our defensive problems out. But Anything thrown into the box was panic stations, so I think they have to sort that out. Yeah, um, conceded 18 goals, six winless games, four defeats and two draws. As an international manager, do you think Steve Clark will be looking and saying, OK, it just it's highlighted maybe a couple of problems, or does he look and say, look, all my focus is on the, the championships? Listen, they played um, Holland away, France, they played Spain away, they played England in this run of, you know, the winless run. So <laughs> I wouldn't be too perturbed about it, Peter. You know, they're not competitive games. And I think his starting 11 is excellent. I think they've got a really good starting 11. I thought they played well against Holland for large periods of the game. And he will need to get other players up to speed, if you want to put it that, get minutes into their legs against probably Northern Ireland in the, in the next game. But I think Scotland are a good place. I think they've got a good squad of players. I think the scoreline flattered Holland. You know, if you overall <laughs> performance, even Koeman came out and said in the first half, Scotland were the better team. So it shows to me that while it may not look like progress, in Steve's mind, you know, they're playing against top-ranked opposition, and that's what you want going into the tournament. The last two games, probably Gibraltar and Finland, will be just tune-up games for the for the squad. But I think he know in his mind what is his best 13 or 14 are and he's in a good place I think yeah, I, I like the way they, they went about their business in that first half the way they moved the ball I mean uh, this is this is the football that everybody wants to see No I, I thought Scotland as Neil said for 60-70 minutes were, were superb he made a lot of changes um, you know he, br he brought four or five players on and then it, I'm not wanting to put the finger of blame onto them but they came on and were a bit off the pace you know Suter Ralston uh, and the subs just they, they collapsed the last fifteen twenty minutes. But I thought mid I thought our midfield was superb against a good Holland team. Um, I thought that that three in there with McTominay, uh, McGinn, and particularly Billy Gilmore, who I thought was superb. You know, it's going to be a it's going to be a job for Callum McGregor possibly to get back into that midfield because I thought the three of them for <coughs> really dominated a good Holland team. So I, I, I agree with Neil. I, I don't think you'll take. You know, any kind of misconfidence from that result, Peter. I think they'll, they'll, they'll go away, lick their wounds, and they'll try and win the game tomorrow night. Yeah, if anything, uh, Ruffy, you get to a situation where the biggest problem he's had over his time since he started was always about the back line. It's always about trying to avoid losing those goals because there were times when you were actually looking at Scotland thinking they're going to have to score minimum two to even get a draw, uh, never mind the win, um, because of the back line. So... Uh, that's the one key area I think, you know, from any friendlies up until the championships that the, they'll be working on. Although, let's look at the players who'll suddenly become available. You know, you'll have hopefully Tierney and Robertson without any great injuries. McKenna, Hanley will be at least back. They'll all be back available for them. I, I, would, I would hazard a guess that eight of that 11 who started the game plus Callum McGregor would be nine of the 11 mm. of our best 11. 
of the of the team that played the other, started the game. If you throw in McGregor, I, I would say there's only two places up for grabs. If it's Shanklin, it's the number one, then there's only one place up for grabs because I think that's the nucleus of the side, our best side. I, I just think he needs to find players who play in a different way for club level, I think, international. Neil know better than me. I just think it's a different kind of player you need at international level because you <coughs> you don't play the same style of football. Guys are right. Midfield, I think, we're superb. I think B. Billy Gilmer's a stick-on for me now. I think he's got to start the game. And McTominay, obviously. But if you read out the team, I think we'd all agree that most of the guys that started the game will be in that Germany side. I think there's only one, Peter, it's Shankland. I think it depends if he plays McGregor, McGinn and McTominay. Uh, and maybe plays McGinn, uh, sorry, just off of uh, Dykes. Or he plays, he likes Christie. Yeah. He, he, he plays Christie a lot, he likes him off of the striker. But I think Dykes will come into the team, I think Dykes will start the first game. Um, and then as Ruffy said, it's either he keeps that midfield three that he had all night or he brings Callum McGregor in. Well, if I'm going to be brutally honest with you, I, I mean, over the last three, four years, Callum McGregor's the best midfielder in Scotland, and I do not see him not starting the game. I think he is the absolute linchpin of the way Scotland play under Steve Clark. Yeah, and he's played all the games, you know, so, yeah, I mean, he's a stick on for me, the goal. Uh, Tom makes a good point, though. The, <laughs> what you're talking about is an abundance of quality midfield players, mm -hmm. which is great for Scotland, you know, and great for Steve. But yeah, I think Callum will play. He's got the experience and, and the quality. Um, and like I said, I think Steve will know what is in his mind, what his best starting eleven will be. It's getting the rest of them to get the sort of close to that level, Peter, because he's going to need the, the squad in depth for the, the three games in the Euros. So the Northern Ireland game and the, the ones leading into the, the tournament are, are pivotal for the legs of your, <coughs> your Ralstons and your... Your Hanleys and all these guys to you know get up to speed. Yeah, uh, I mean I'm looking at that side that, that started Gunn, Tierney, Henry, Porteous, Robertson, McTominay, Gilmore, Patterson, McGinn, Christie, and Shanklin. I, I I actually can only see one change in that team. I D see Dykes uh, for Shanklin. Uh, well, well maybe two, maybe uh, Dykes coming in for Shanklin, but Christie dropping out for McGregor. Well, if he, if he brings, obviously, if he brings McGregor and he'll play possibly McTominay off of the striker, uh, or McGinn, yeah. and he'll play the two, he, he plays with the two with the one in there. So, that, yeah, I think that's it's probably nine or ten in the starting eleven, but it's uh, it's the subs that are a wee bit concerning. Um, as Neil said, you, you know, you need, you're you going to need all, your whole squad in a tournament. You, you're going to need 16, 17 guys you can rely on. And yeah. I'm not sure Scotland have got that at the minute. You, you, don't, think, you don't think the bench is... is, is I don't think it's particularly strong, Peter, no. Um... There's a couple on there, like likes of Armstrong, possibly Kenny McLean, Ferguson, She Adams has been over the course. Ferguson, he's not really. I mean, unless, he, unless he plays Ferguson tomorrow night. I mean, you're not, you, I'm almost certain he's going to play him tomorrow night. But you're not. You're not exactly worried if you're throwing on somebody that's playing in Serie A. No, are you? no that's mm. awesome. I mean, you know, Armstrong's a good in the shirt. midfield, but defensively, you I, think I, about I was Germany just in for depth. In the opening game, you know, Callum McGregor has to play in that mm. game for me. You know, whether he, he sort of. Leaves an attacking option on the bench like a Christie. <coughs> Still got that to call upon if you need it during the game. Um, some of the other players, at Ferguson. These boys have to play now. Because I already think Steve knows what his best team is. Yeah. The rest of them need the experience and you know getting that international feeling going into the tournament. As and I'm part of it. Because sometimes when you've got a, a stick on starting eleven or twelve or whatever you want to call it, the rest of them feel a little bit. Um, he doesn't fancy me or I'm not up to that level. Get them the games now, you know. The Northern Ireland game is important going into the last couple of months before the, the tournament. Yeah, just l let me ask you as a manager, um, I, and it was somebody was talking about it the other day there to me, you know, if you look back at Craig Brown, Craig Brown had a set 11 in his World Cup mm -hmm. team and he never deviated. It, you know, it's, I think a lot of players found it very difficult, even if they were playing well, they were never going to get in that start. I think the 11. game's changed since then, Pete. Yeah. You know, we're talking like 25, 30 years ago, the game's moved on from then. Well, that's what I was I going to ask you. Steve's mind, he'll have a... You know, a rotation in mind for for the game, and then again, you got to think on your feet. You got to see how the game's going at that particular time. Yeah. Did you feel Martin was a, a stickler for eleven that it was his strongest? Yeah. Yeah. He was. Yeah. But, but he was right because we won every week. Do you know what I mean? And you know that old adage about not changing a winning team, and you know also that um, thought process where he trusts some players. Like you know what I mean? 
<laughs> Gareth Southgate at the minute gets it in the neck a little bit about the, the Jordan Henderson thing, but he didn't play the other night and they lost to Brazil. So in the back of his mind, Gareth's going, you know, Jordan's still a, an important part of the squad despite what the outside interests think. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting one now, Ruffy. I know, I know you've said the game's changed. Tam's mm -hmm. already suggesting we don't have you know, quality and abundance to call from the bench. And, uh, you know, I agree with Neil. I think he definitely knows what his strongest... Mm -hmm. I think we could all pick his strongest 11. Yeah, I think, as I said earlier, I think that's near enough it. But I do think Armstrong and McLean, people like that coming in, have had enough games under their belt. If they were thrown in there at any particular time, you know, wouldn't let us down. You know, I think they're playing at a high level in their own club. Defensively. Uh, as well. It's defensible. It was not. I think we all agree for seventy minutes we were good. So he has to analyse the last twenty minutes. You know, was it because we made so many changes? Was it so many guys come on were off the speed of the game? Were people tired? You know, because they had a lot of possession of the ball. And the, the the score line suggests that the, the, the latter game maybe spaces start developing that weren't there early or on, you know, so I think that the last 30 the 20 minutes will be the thing that he's sitting down and trying to analyse how that happened. Although, let's be brutally honest about it, at that level, when you're playing that level of side, you have to take your chances. Yeah, I mean, listen, we had two, two very good chances, obviously, I think the great save of the goalkeeper from Christie's in the first half, tips it onto the crossbar and then Shankland. You know, Shankland's getting criticised, it was his one big opportunity, you know, Holland was sloppy and he went through. And I think for Hearts, nine times out of ten, he buries it and he just lifts it too high and it hits the top of the bar. And people are saying, oh, he's not the answer, you've got to be ruthless. But I thought he played well on it, Shankland. I thought, I, I look at a striker, I look at his overall performance, I thought he held the ball in well. Um, he ran in behind when he had to. And I thought he's all-round performance, but strikers are judging goals and he's, he's judged ultimately on missing that chance. But... I think that's unfair. I think he showed that he can. He's capable of leading the line in a one. In yeah. a tournament, um, did the play well? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Did they create good chances? Mm. Yeah. You got to be happy with that. Yep. Yeah. Scotland mm. wouldn't have done that five, six years ago, yeah. Pete. Yeah. You know they wouldn't have got out of the, their own half. Mm. You know, so there's definite progression for me. Look, Steve's taking Scotland out of two Euro Championships. I think I, I'd be excited about the Scotland thing. You know, I think they've got. A plethora of uh, Premier League players playing at big clubs and playing well for them as well, sprinkled with you know players who are playing at, uh, in you know top Scottish teams like Shanklin and, and McGregor. A couple of boys are playing in the Championship, maybe not playing week in week out at that higher level, but still you know a decent squad. And then you've got Ferguson, he could be a bonus ball for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just a little footnote to all of this. Um, Scott McTominay has been named as the Scottish Football Writers mm -hmm. Men's International Player of the Year. It's been it's been phenomenal for him when you think about it, Ruffy. There was a period where he was in a rich vein of form of scoring goals, club and country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and initially in the early days, I don't think the manager knew where to play him. I don't think he knew what his best place was. He played him at the back, he played him wide at the back, he played him in midfield. You know, but I think he's he's taking the mantle over for McGinn just now and getting forward and getting goals. Took a wee bit of the pressure off of John McGinn. Our strikers aren't prolific and John McGinn was coming up with the goals. But now McTommy in the past year has been the one and uh, you can see why he got that award. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any great surprise from Steve Clark saying he had to be the man picked up today? You know, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, look, it hurts, you know, it's a... On paper, it looks a heavy defeat, but you got to analyse the game as a whole. And by all, you know, I think, you know, for 70 minutes, they played great. Yeah. He's got to take a lot from that, like, you know what I mean? But to lose 4 0, it's not a great look, and he has to front it up with the press. Now, again, I think Scotland are good. I think they're a good team. I think they've got a, a group that they can get out of. It's not going to be easy, Pete. You know, first game is Germany in Germany. But I think, you know, even if they don't win that, they can get four to six points out of the other two games. Yeah, um, of course, Scotland against uh, Northern Ireland. Yeah, that'll be difficult. Yeah. Scotland, Northern Ireland, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, so, good players come from there. <laughs> I, I was just about to say, I am going to ask you about your country because obviously it's a, it's a, a, a period of, I wouldn't say transition, but I'm interested to get your take on it in a moment. Patrick Mullen, our man, was out there to preview this game. 
The Scotland squad have been training at Hamden this afternoon as they continue their preparations for the upcoming friendly against Northern Ireland. They'll look to return to winning ways after that disappointing 4-0 defeat at the hands of the Netherlands. But despite that defeat, the mood was high in training amongst the players. But according to Steve Clark, that is completely normal in this squad. It may take him, however, a little longer to get over the defeat. I think they've had to pick me up. I tend to sulk a little bit longer than they do. <laughs> they, they move on a little bit quicker than I do uh, because I've probably got a little bit more to think about than they have. Mm. Within 24, 36 hours, you, you're ready for the next game. You're looking for the next game. I, I think I get the feeling, I get the mood among the players that they, they just want uh, the chance to get on the pitch on Tuesday night and, and look to improve and maybe put right a few things that, that went wrong for us in the last stages of the game on Friday. One of Scotland's key players in the qualification process was Scott McTominay, who chipped in with a number of goals. He insisted this afternoon the job is far from over and he wants to create something special this summer in Germany. Um, yeah, of course. Like we've, we've had the, the sour moments against, against Croatia and the, and the tough moments. So we know what to expect and we don't want them feelings again. And we want to be the most successful Scottish team in history to, to, to go there and, and show that we can do it. And, and I'm full of belief in, in the whole team and obviously the manager and the coaching staff as well. It's Scotland versus Northern Ireland here at Hamden on Tuesday night. Kicks off at 7.45 and PLZ Soccer will be there live, keeping you up to date. Yeah, good game to look forward to. Um, what's your take on Northern Ireland um, at this moment in, in time at international level? It's not, not great. It's, um, like we had that you know, purple patch when they got to the Euros in 2016, you know, but you, you had a real sort of a platform of you know, stalwarts like Gareth McCauley, Steve Davis, Johnny Evans, you know, Cal Lafferty. Um, and all those players now are, are gone, you know, they've moved on. So, Michael, you know, you t touched on the word transitional period. I think it's more than that. You know, it's a total rebuild. So the team's young, you know, and you've got players who aren't playing at the, the highest level. Got a couple, you know, Connor Bradley at, at Man United, he's fantastic. You know, the lad Shea Charles, he's a you know, really good prospect. And then the lad Reid, who has had a great season at Stevenage, has popped up with a really good goal. Um, against Romania the other night, so it's embryonic, you know, I don't think there's any huge expectation on Mechel and the, and the team at the minute, so, you know, they're building for, obviously, the World Cup qualification, and maybe more so the Euros in 2028. Yeah, and, and I suppose when you look at the last couple of results, Denmark and Romania always had a good international pedigree, so he'll be heartened by that. Massively. Look, the, the Denmark game was a dead rubber, you yeah. know, the <clears throat> Denmark had already qualified and it was the last game of the group, And but they needed it just for confidence more than anything else and it was a good win and they deserved to win. And then to go to Romania here unbeaten, I think, in 10 or 11 games, that was a terrific result. It'll be a test, you know, for both teams tomorrow, but I think Scotland, you know, have got far superior players at the minute, you know. It's, it's a really good crop of Scottish players, I think, Pete, and, you know, they've sealed through the group, you know, when most people didn't think they would. So there's a belief and a confidence there. And you've got, like I say, you've got you know, a couple of world-class players in the Scotland team, but the, the majority of this team are playing really well at Premier League level. A couple of world-class players? Well, Robertson, for me, is a world-class player. Yep. McGinn, on his day, can be world-class. Tierney, on his day, can be world-class. So, yeah, for me, like, you know, they've got... Um, some quality. I mean, Andy's been one of the best left backs in the world for a long, long time. Yeah. Okay. Um, good to get your thoughts on that. Of course, as ever, when you get a, a Northern Ireland manager fronting up, who's one of a number of people linked with the Aberdeen job, um, I, I think Michael O'Neill was quick just to distance himself from all the uh, links with the Don's vacancy. This is something that is is probably a result of me living in Scotland and me recently going to the St Mirren game where, where uh, uh, when I left Aberdeen we were leading 1-0 but um, actually when I got to the car they'd been beaten 2-1 so I had nothing to do with that either but uh, so I just think that like it's uh, as a result of that I've said all along you know when you, when you commit to a contract it doesn't mean that you'll see it out but it means that there's commitment on both sides which there is um, so, again, at the end of the day, he's going to be linked with the job, you've been linked with it. They're taking their time in, 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 in trying to select someone. I think they've got a preferred candidate. Yeah. I don't know who that is. Um, I, I'm, 
and they're, they're talking as if an announcement will be imminent in the next few days. So just have to wait and see. In terms of Michael, you know, I think he's on a long-term contract there. You know, and um, I think he wants again. He's a safe pair of hands as far as Northern Ireland concerned because he's, he's done it before, and you know he's rebuilding again. So. I, I thought that was a bit sort of folly, you know, that sort of story coming out there. Yeah. Um, you want my best Michael O'Neill story? Yeah. Um, Michael and Darren Jackson. Yeah. Um, uh, friend, I was friends with him in Edinburgh, and Michael always used to get on his bike, and he would cycle to Easter Road or Wardy where they would train, and um, a number of the old firm stars would stay in Edinburgh to obviously stay out of the madness. Uh, and Michael got to Princess Street, Ruffy, with his uh, racer bike um, at the traffic lights. <laughs> and, he, and he looked round, and there was Trevor Stephen in a Porsche 911. <laughs> just, <laughs> there's, not a lot, there's not a lot you can do, yeah. isn't there? You, know, just, yeah. you just have to yeah. keep pedalling. <laughs> I, I drove by Trevor Stephen's house in Edinburgh. Yeah? That's right, uh, it's not far from Wardy. Yeah. Some pad, I right, some pad. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, nice of Tam just to obviously stay mm -hmm. out range <laughs> <laughs> houses in Edinburgh, eh, Ruffy? Uh -huh. um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Michael, Michael told that story, as if to say, just the difference in the earning capacity. Mm -hmm. Although, uh, Michael was a, a really good player who'd a, who'd a good career. Good uh, very, you know. Yeah, he's a decent player, good player. Good teammate, funny. He's a good coach as well, you know, he's done... Wonderful thing. Northern Ireland suits him, and he's an intelligence about him as well. You know, and, yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot of faith in Michael. Yeah, and on the flip side of that, Trevor Stephen was a wonderful player, mm -hmm. um, and actually good part partner as well, Ruffy. Yeah, I didn't know him that well, yeah. you know, but uh, obviously Graham thought very highly of him as well, you know, and uh, and he had a good international career. Who was your Who was your roommate when you were in international duty, Neil? Um, had a few like Steve Loomis. Yeah. Uh, Jim and Jilton. <laughs> was there a player in that squad that you actually, you know, pro probably when you were in the international scene, people were looking at you to contribute, but were there other players that you actually thought, oh, this is great playing alongside them? Yeah, but Michael Hughes was a very good player. Yeah. I don't know mm. if you remember Michael. Yeah, Michael, West yeah. Ham and Man City. And, and David Haley, like, was terrific. David was one of them where, you know, club career wasn't probably what it should have been but his international career was fantastic like you know he was a superhero wasn't he? Trick against Spain yeah and like, he scored the winner against England mm -hmm. I remember playing against Denmark and he scored a 35 yarder against Schmeichel you know he just had that I mean the leading goal scorer for Northern Ireland before David was Ian Dewey with 13 goals I think David ended up with 36 37 you know for a club a country of Northern Ireland you know that's some return yeah absolutely and um, what was your favorite international game um, we beat uh, Austria 5-3 at uh, Windsor Park. That was a really great night. <coughs> you know? yeah. Did you ever score for your country? I did score too, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, scored a couple. Brilliant. A couple of tap-ins for our post beat. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be at the far post. That's, that's, it. that's, that's exactly time. it. Um, yeah, um, international football. Um, I hope we can get the win. I, I, I'm no disrespect to Northern Ireland, but I think you'll want to be on the front foot for this one. Yeah, I, I think it's it's important for Scotland to kind of stop the rot with the six defeats and all. It's been playing top opposition. Uh, I think if they lost in Northern Ireland and uh, the next two games, I think there would be a, a wee bit of panic in Gibraltar and Finland <laughs> coming up. But yeah, I'd, I'd fancy Scotland to go and take care of Northern Ireland at home. Uh, I think he'll play a mix and match of the players that you're usually playing. I think Lewis Ferguson will play. The goalkeeper will be an interesting one. I don't know who's going to play in goal. Will he play? I don't think Angus Gunn will play. So will he play Xander Clark, Craig Gordon, or possibly Liam Kelly, Ruffy? Ruffy, yeah, Ruffy. Do you think he'll play in the morning night? Sight, Ruffy. Uh, if, uh, if Angus is the number one, sh I think he should play all the games. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, he knows individually what the others can do. You know, that uh, you can... When you come to the Finland game and the Gibraltar game, you're just going to be watching that nobody gets injured. It's like seven days before the first game, so you might get some of them a couple of games there, you yeah. know. But uh, no, I think you want to be playing all the time. I like that. I love that. Do you know why you're saying that? I love that because knowing him as I do, he's such a selfish so and so. He wanted. Keepers usually are. He aren't just him. wanted to have all the games so that nobody could get a sniff mm, of the yeah. number one jersey. That was keepers and number nines. Yeah. Mate. yeah. All the same. <laughs> they always <laughs> think about playing and then we think about scoring goals. Yeah. yeah. And then you get your wee envelope at the end for the boots, which always helps. Yeah. What was that? What's the? A puma. Whatever boots you wore, you always got a wee extra. 
Did you? See? Honestly, <laughs> that was an angle for you. You get money per cap, man? You get more money for wearing the boots than what you did for playing for your country. When you were playing? Yeah. Yeah? Mm. So My fee at Scotland was only £100 then. My God. And you get £200 for the boots. And to be fair, by the way, it's cheap. It's a mercenary. I know, it really is. But it, but <laughs> it's an Ollie McLeod coming up to what I'll give you a rest of it. Uh, I could, uh, <laughs> That's exactly what he did. Uh, I, uh, I could tell you a story. <laughs> Unfortunately, the big man's not here anymore. Uh, big Gordon. Yeah. Uh, we're playing Belgium, over in Belgium. And uh, TV cameras were of there and the, the reps were of there. And he said to me before the game, he says, what size of boot are you? I said, I'm a 10. He says, I see you're wearing uh, Puma Royals or whatever they were called. And he says, I said, I want Adidas. So I just want the half time, we'll get a double done. <laughs> <laughs> so we swap boots at half time, we get 400 quid. Oh my God. <laughs> 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 oh, the glory of playing for your To be fair, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I don't think the Scotland, I don't think the Scotland players take yeah, the fee no. until they get to you know, a tournament, yeah, to a mm -hmm. tournament and, and, and then you know there's a pool in there like, yeah there's you know? a pool yeah. you know so I, I don't think they've been uh, I don't think they've been taking them unless they qualify you know over the certainly over the last decade mm -hmm. that's been the case yeah. so you know playing for enough to get his money up front <laughs> well, we weren't getting paid the money they're getting now because I mean that was just a stand but the money was immaterial the hundred pound was yeah we just Wearing the jersey, as Neil will tell you. Much did you? Much did you get? I can't remember. Yeah, wouldn't have been a lot, like you know what I mean. Um, we're on decent money, obviously playing for Leicester in the Premier League. So I, again, it was like a kitty, and then money was handed out if you wanted it, like you know what I mean. Sometimes the boys didn't even take it, like. Yeah, who was the mm. best international jersey you swapped with someone? Oh, Figo. Figo's good. Yeah, Figo's good enough for me, by the way. <laughs> um, well, I'm happy with that. Some player, isn't it, Tom? Oh, are you some yeah. player, eh? Absolutely. OK, we're going to talk about uh, domestic football coming up at the weekend as well, because Tom gets excited about domestic football returning. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm loath at times to sometimes comment on what I call utterly stupid stories which really pander to a small minority who uh, end up getting the ear of boardrooms, PR people at their clubs, and they make a complaint. And, and, and this one is just utterly ridiculous, Ruffy. Um, hearts have hit out at uh, Rangers. Uh, defacing is the story, the club's badge. Um, I'm gobsmacked that Hearts even put this out because <coughs> the, the Sky Sports Scottish Cup final uh, was played at Tynecastle. Here's a, here's a statement that was put out in regards to the sticker that was over the Hearts badge. Heart of Midlothian Football Club is aware of images circulating of the Tynecastle Park home dressing room at today's Sky Sports Scottish Cup final. Although the club uh, hands over the running of the stadium on the day to the competition organisers, the SWPL, we were involved with pre-match planning. We would therefore like to assure our supporters that we did not approve any request for dressing room branding in either dressing room for either club involved. And it goes on to say, it is extremely disappointing to learn that our wishes were disregarded. How this came to be is a matter for the SWPL and Rangers to sort. But needless to say, no explanation will be satisfactory in our eyes or the eyes of our fans. Nevertheless, we will demand answers to ensure that our club crest is never defaced again. It is also regrettable that this action has taken away the focus from what was a successful cup final and another opportunity to grow women's football in Scotland. I can't believe Hearts have put that out. I mean, honestly, if somebody stuck a badge over the badge, it's a cup final. They've been chosen as... I mean, look at it, Ruffy. I mean, they've been chosen mm -hmm. as the venue... They are not in charge of the venue for that day. It's a mm -hmm. cup final, but even that, sticking a badge over it, they can take it off. It's not as if somebody's done it with a with a sharpie spray, and yeah. defaced the, the, the badge. Uh, initially, that's what I thought. You know, I thought somebody had spray painted something and, and sort of wrecked the, the, the dressing room. And yeah. then when I found out it was a sticker, it's just a piece of nonsense, you know, because I think when Hearts, and quite rightly so, were chosen for that venue is because of the stadium and the atmosphere it brings there. I'd, I'm hazarding, I guess, they will be reimbursed financially for the stadium being used. So sticking a sticker over, I'm sure they would have taken it off at the end, you know. So 
no harm done as far as I'm concerned. I, I mean, I hate, I, hate to, I hate to say this, but if somebody calls up and says, I'm not happy with the sticker over the, over the badge, I would actually say, yeah, any chance you could go and watch the news and see what's happening instead of moaning about a badge that's over your badge, get real. Thank you very much and good night. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. It's just, it's just a non-story, Peter. It's just nonsense. It's just a slow... Maybe it's a slow weekend in terms of stuff to talk about um, in terms of Scottish football. As I said, it's not. It's, it's a cup final. It's a neutral venue. You know, and they're, they're put the badge over that they can take it off after the game. You know, it's, I, I think it's a nonsense. I, I well, can't believe really you're talking the, the about it. The cameras weren't in, this, in the dressing room, were they? They came in, I think they were in... After the game, and was it visual? Was it visual on the thing? Right. Okay. Well, well, I would, make a difference? No, no. Well, I, would, I thought the only people that were in that dressing room were the whatever team was in. The Rangers team was in it. So I, I what, why really tell everybody else? The hearts and trying no. to show disrespect. I mean, it's just a well, badge. When you go to Hamden, you've your own branding in each of the the dressing rooms, mm. Pete. Whether if you're playing a semi final or a final, and obviously the girls thought that was the, the same thing to do. Or Rangers thought it would. For me, it's it's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. You just pick it up and say thanks, Hearts, for the venue, and we've won the cup, and you know we appreciate it. But it's just so pedantic. And then they're saying, you know, it's a pity the focus has been taken away from this. But you're the ones making the the statement. Yeah, yeah. you're the ones, you know, making the noise. It's a non-story. Just. Yeah. Just let it go. I think they're appealing to a very small, small minority. minority yeah. Sensible Hearts fans are looking, saying, "Get on with it." Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. just concentrate on the fact that Rangers um, won the final, and yeah. you know, disappointment for obviously Brian Graham mm -hmm. uh, and his side. But Rangers too strong on the day, Ruffy. Yeah, I think uh, going along the day would have been a great day for the girls. We spoke to a couple of them a couple of weeks ago at the Queen's Park game. They were really looking forward to it. They've come so far in the last couple of years. Brian's done a tremendous job there and uh, they come up against a, a really good side and quality goals as well, you know, which was good. OK, um, the Championship uh, had the chance to take centre stage over the weekend when you have international football. Uh, I don't know about you, but there's a, I just get the sense that there's a squeaky bum time up at Tannadice. Yeah, I think the pressure's heavily on Dundee United, Peter. I think with the budget they've got, you know, the, the amount of losses they're, you know, c coming up with every single season, you know, under the under Ogren. Um and they've got to win the league, Peter. They've got to go up this season. Or, they, or else they could be in real financial trouble next next season. Ian Murray's an ex teammate of mine at Hibs, still speak to him uh, regular. I'd love to see Wraith winning for him, winning the league. I think it would be a massive achievement. Wraith Rovers have not been in the top flight for 25, 30 years, you know, for a, and they're a club on the up. Yeah, they've got investors putting a wee bit of money in as well, but their, their budget's nowhere near comparable to Dundee United. So, huge game coming up at the weekend up at Tannadice. Um, and if Dundee United lose that game and Wraith go top, then I think the manager will be under pressure, Peter. And it's incredible for me to say that because I think they're still narrowly top at the minute. Yeah. But they're making heavy wear of this, Peter. They, they, in my opinion, they should be they should be miles clear in that league with the budget they've got and the and the strength and depth of the squad. So, all the pressure is on Dundee United for me this weekend. Yeah, two wins in the last six. Yeah, it's not good, especially as Tom says for me. You know, I'd have thought Dundee United would have squished it. Mm. You know, been well clear by now. Yeah. You know, they lost to them for Emlyn. and then you know a disappointing draw with Inverness, who are really struggling at the minute, Pete. So it's not good. You know, and you always expect Dundee United is one of the, the major clubs in Scotland. If they don't go up, there'll be yeah massive ramifications. I'd imagine, like you know, the player Wraith, Wraith have a game in hand as well. You know, if Wraith were to win the game at the weekend, the two points clear with the game in hand, they'll take some catching. If you look at the run-ins on both the teams, yeah, I think if that were to happen, Ruffy, uh, Jim Goodwin would be facing mm -hmm. goals for his head. I think he knows that. He knows the the pressures that's up there. You know, and what's been going on at Dundee United manager-wise for the past two or three seasons. It's going to be a massive game at the weekend. I would hazard a guess that the attendance at that game will outshine most of the Premier League games uh, this weekend. I think there'll be a massive atmosphere there, and uh, I think it's up to Dundee United to prove that they are Premiership material. But I've said it all along. You know that even. The two of them, I think, will think they're good enough to beat the second bottom of the Premiership whenever that happens. So? Yeah, yeah. You think? You think yeah. whoever? I think every. I think most possible. of the Championship teams who played the Premier teams in the Scottish Cup. I know it's only a one-off game, but every one of them came out handsomely. 
So well, if, Partick went up with Ross County and won 3 0. Yeah. So you reckon, I mean, uh, if, who do you think is going to win the league? Just I think Dundee United should, mm-hmm. should, but I still think Wraith Rovers would be good enough to take a St John <coughs> or a Ross County See, or whoever. For me as well, roughly, there's no guarantee it, whoever finishes second could make it out of the playoffs. Yeah, yeah. You know, because Partick are in there. Partick. Actually, are going well at the Dumb moment. Dunfermline are on a wee bit of a run. So, you know, over the two games, I mean, Partick Thistle, I think they finished they the bottom team in the playoffs and they blew everyone away. You know, and they were very narrowly, you know, not in the Premier League due to a penalty shootout. They probably, you know, snatched, defeat, you know, defeat from the jaws of victory, really. Yeah. You know, in, so in, that, in that Champions League, I've noticed every team goes through a bad spell. Uh-huh. Every team will go six games without winning a game. And you either have it at the beginning, you have it in the middle, you have it at the end. If you have it at the end, that's when you're struggling. And that's what's happening to Dundee United just now. So you think Dundee United, what about yourself, Neil? I don't know, to be honest with you. you know, I think Saturday is a pivotal it's game. It's huge. You know, and... Um, Only six games left. Psychologically as well, you know, yeah. I, I agree with Tom, what a job Ian Murray's done there with Wraith Rovers. Mm. Didn't see that coming at the start of the season. So you reckon winner takes all from this game? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I, th- I think... Wraith Rovers would go up there and take a point now. I think Ian Murray would take a point. You know, they're still in, they're still in their hands, you know. Yeah, but six games left if, if Wraith win. If Dundee United win and they go four points clear, then I think it's over. Um, but if Wraith even draw the game, then it's still in the melting pot. Interesting times. And if you were talking about the the three that were going to make it into the playoff? Well, Partick Thistle, obviously, I think will be will finish third. And then you've got a real mix there. I'm just looking at the league table there. Airdrie, 39 points. Dunfermline, 38 Morton 37, Queen's Park 36, A90 35. So there's not a lot in it, Peter. And Inverness Cali have got 32. So one of those clubs could still get sucked into a, into a playoff at the bottom of the league. So it's a really exciting league. A lot to play for. Our both, obviously, I think, are gone. Um, but, you know, that, that fourth place could be any one of three or four clubs. Yeah. Hopefully, are United for, for Bruni. I fancy Morton to sneak in, Ruffy. Is that why? Well, they're going through that bad run I'm mm-hmm. talking about. Yeah. No, they, they've had their seven or eight games undefeated and now they've went two or three, no winning it. And a very, very difficult team to beat down there. I don't think you'd want to get down there and guaranteed three points. I think Dunfermline are on and could, James. or Airdrie could get that fourth place. I think this will stick on. Yeah. You know, I don't think they've got any chance of catching Wraith Rovers or Dundee United, but... It's really important, you know, we, we talk about finances and budgets, you know, the difference between third place and fourth place is something like £100,000 oh, really? when you get cashed out at the end of the year, yeah. so that's got to be in the back of the mind as well, and nobody's ever qualified for third or fourth, I don't think. Yeah, isn't it great? I think Hamilton Aki's were the last one against... Uh, Hibs. Hibs, Hibs, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, since I've known Ruffy, he's the one man that he's on the bonuses. The checks that you get, he knows, written, he knows all of it. The, yeah. the, the, the cash, um, you know, things. Anything <laughs> for a bonus, Neil. He, he <laughs> loves your, a bonus. He's your man. <laughs> what was your favourite game? Well, it goes back to the game where we got this bonus. We <laughs> <laughs> were out three nights before. It was a really good laugh. <laughs> um, but interesting in the championship. We'll wait to see uh, how that's going to go. But of course, uh, just one we mention of uh, Louis Moult because the mm. goal that he scored was an absolute belter and, and that is down to strikers who've always had that little glance to see I know mm. where the keeper's positioned this ball's dropped to me I don't have to think twice Yeah, fantastic goal Peter I think he sat in the bench he came on at half time which was unusual um, obviously got them a point fantastic goal uh, and you know I think Lauren Shanklin scored a few as well you know from long range yeah. um, and as you said as a striker or a forward you're always having a wee look to see where the goalkeeper is uh, see if you can maybe catch him out I think of the uh, certainly of the ones involving Scottish clubs. For me, Kemar Roof's goal for Rangers mm-hmm. in the European game was the best I'd seen because not only did he know where the keeper was, but he'd actually to beat I think two players. And the, p- the pitch was a quagmire. I remember it was raining heavily. Yeah, and he beat two players and got to the halfway line, and then mm-hmm. you know bang. Um, which was no mean feat of control as well, Ruffy. I'm trying to think of any others that you can think of. Rooney at West Ham was an absolute belter. Charlie uh, Adam against Chelsea. Charlie Adam against Chelsea. Oh, is a, Beckham against Wimbledon. Yeah. Beckham's against Wimbledon. Is I remember when I was a kid, I was talking to Ruffy off air, watching the 78 World Cup, and uh, there was a boy called it was Van der Kerkhoff twins. I think it was Robbie. Rennie and Willie. Well, yeah. Rennie. And Rennie scored one against Italy because I... 
a wee thing for Italy, like, you know, because I like the, the shirt and all that. Yeah. And Renny van der Kerkhoff scored a, I've never seen a goal like it, 35 yarder, smacked off the post and in, and Dino's off was a goalkeeper and he was beating all ends up. Yeah. Um, I, I, am I and actually against Ruffy? Yeah, am I going no, to be a pain in the back end here? <laughs> am I right in thinking? I know you say Renny van. Is this the was this the seventy eight World Cup? Uh -huh. yeah. Am I not thinking that was Ari Han Ruffy who hit oh. that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Yeah, Ari you're right. Now. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Ari Han, it was an absolute yeah, belter. Yeah. But I, I said to Neil, the balls were so light over there. there. <laughs> Most of the most yeah. of the good the goalkeepers were getting beat. <laughs> was was seventy eight the tango? Yeah, it was a tango. Trust yeah. me, it was a tango. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Ariane, yeah, yeah. yeah Ari Han, that was a great. I'm happy with that yeah. shirt, by the way. Oh, yeah. um, no, I shouldn't have mentioned it, but probably the one that we lost in the Euros. The boy scored for the halfway line. Oh, Sheik. Sheik. Patrick yeah. Sheik. That was a belter. Do, do you know what's funny about that? Um, Davy Marshall. Davy Marshall come up on stage. He come up on stage at a dinner, and you could see the he, the fear in his face as he came up, and he, he he was absolutely in his mind. He thought, "I'm going to be absolutely mentioning it," and, and I didn't want to mention it to him because the one thing about you keepers, you hate getting beat from this. Have you ever been absolutely? I mean, apart from the ones that uh, crushed the whole nation. <laughs> Um, but have you ever been beaten? No. <laughs> you ever been beaten with a long, a no, long one, Ruffy? No, I don't think so. No, no, definitely no, not. No. I can't think of any that you. I know Andy Ritchie tried it a couple of times for oh. the centre. Aye, yeah. to a wee tap to the side, and he'd, he'd have a one. He actually tried to shoot for the corner flag. Yeah, do you want me to tell you a great uh, Andy Ritchie story, which um, Mark McGee and Gordon Strachan tell it about uh, Sir Alex Ferguson, um, which is just basically. <laughs> Andy Ritchie was just the scourge of Aberdeen because he was so good. Aye. And uh, and all week Fergie was in hairdryer mode and he just basically said to the defence, every one of them, he said, and in the midfield of Aberdeen and obviously the, the, the forwards, he says, from the kickoff, do not let Andy Ritchie do anything on him. Every minute he's in the game, get on his case. He said, I'm telling you right now, make sure Ritchie does nothing against us. <laughs> <laughs> Ruffy, Andy Ritchie, the boy, the referee blows the whistle on Andy Ritchie, a lob gym late <laughs> from the kickoff. <laughs> and you can see Fergie at the side and Gordon's dragging Mark McGee saying he's going tonto. Um, but Andy Ritchie was like that, wasn't he? He was oh, such yeah, a good he's player. He's a maverick, wasn't he? Oh, oh you, it's, to the 26. Uh, Did he? 26 uh, years of age. Outside of the foot. Him and David Cooper were the only two people in Scotland that used to hit the ball with the outside of the foot. Yeah, uh, way back then. I think he player of the year one year, didn't he? Aye, Andy, Andy Dye, guy, did yeah, die. Yeah, he was such a wonderful player. Just, you he wonder, was. there are players like that, you just wish they had an even longer period that you could savour them. You know, people talk about best, Jimmy Johnson, Andy Ritchie comes into that vein where you think 26, 27 years of age oh. and, 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 and it's gone. And his height when he was, I don't know what weight he was, he was about... Seven or seventeen stone, something like that. And Tony Higgins was about the same. Used to play with Hibs, and Hibs and Morton were playing at uh, I think it was Capel or something like that. And the two of them went in for a challenge, and they banged into each other. And I think it was Arthur Mumford said, "Well, the uh, groundsman's going to take a while to fill that hole." <laughs> yeah, um, still two great players, um, Rangers, um, getting ready for the weekend. Uh, I think when we're back to the, the domestic issues, uh, Rangers have got a couple of injury worries uh, ahead of uh, you know the big games that are coming thick and fast. Uh, Red Van Yilmaz sent home from international duty. I think he only lasted about 27 minutes uh, with uh, a thigh injury, so that's a worry. Uh, and obviously Ross McCausland as well uh, sent home by Northern Ireland. So uh, that's that's the one thing both sides don't want ahead of that big showdown on April 7th. Yeah, it could be pivotal, Peter. I think that Celtic are starting to get players back and Rangers are going the other way. They're starting to lose players through injury. I think if Yilmaz is injured... Barisic has been in Siberia. You know, he's he's not been you know quoted at all. He's not been playing. Yeah. I think he's going. I think he's going to leave. He's it. He's going to leave it end of the season. I don't think the manager fancies him, but you have to play him. I don't. I, I don't think Rangers have got enough left back in the books that can that can fill in there unless they play a midfield player or something. But that would be a big blow. I like Yelmaz. I think he's a good player, um, and that would be a blow. McCausland's a bit of a squad player in and out, so I don't think that will be a, a massive issue for Rangers. But with Celtic starting to get players back, you know, like of Hatati and. Carter Vickers and guys like that, and then Rangers losing some key players. That could be, that could be the difference in the, in the whole firm game coming up. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for the weekend, uh, as far as the games, everybody will be looking and thinking, OK, Rangers against Tibbs, we'll be watching that. Uh, Livingston against Celtic, you know, 24 hours later. And you've got that battle at the top end. But the most interesting one, I think, you know, is Aberdeen against Ross County, uh, Ruffy, because if Ross County were to go to Aberdeen, uh, it Aberdeen. Win. Yeah, uh, and Aberdeen have been notorious for things like that happening. You know, when you expect them to go on a wee run. Uh, yeah, I think the three strikers for Ross County, if he plays them, uh, will we'll get Aberdeen some problems. But I still think Aberdeen have got to, they've got to kick on. They've got to kick on eventually. I still yeah. think they've got players in there if they all get together, as we've seen on numerous occasions when they all turn up at the right time. That they win the games and they win them quite comfortably. Well, I think that would be the case. They want the new manager in for that game, Peter, to get a wee bit of bounce. I think they want the new manager in for that game. Well, the, the suggestion is, as Neil mentioned there, obviously everybody's uh, been spoken to that has to be spoken to. They've got a they've got a short list. They've got a preferred candidate. Whether they actually start to contact, you know, whoever it is that they want to take over, they want them in before the international games are finished. Ruffy, mm. it's as simple as that. Yeah, I think the supporters would demand that as well. It's an important time for Aberdeen. We we all know Aberdeen should be a top four side. You know, they should be up there. The fans have been. You know, hanging on uh, in every breath, no waiting in that happening. It's not going to happen this year, obviously, but uh, they really need it. It's, it's the choice. It's getting it right this time, you know, because if the owner or whoever it is doesn't get it right, the fans are going to be on the top of them. I mean, this weekend could be really, really painful because they've got to win. Ruffy's saying, oh, you know, they've got to turn the corner. Um, but if. I think they'll beat Ross County at home. Yeah, but. I think Ross County, when they play at home, they're a different team. Yeah. I just think Aberdeen will have too much of them. If they were to lose and St well, Johnston won, suddenly Aberdeen would hit second bottom. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see Ross County winning. Peter, they've, they've, they've home, away there because very poor. I think they've won one game. We feel home all season. Aberdeen should beat them. Interesting stuff at the bottom of the table, but of course at uh, the weekend, uh, as well as Aberdeen, Ross County, Hearts against Kilmarnock, Motherwell against St Mirren, Rangers against Hibs, St Johnson against Dundee and Livingston against Celtic. Um, you would imagine that Rangers will have a, a, a real chance to put the pressure on Celtic because Hibs haven't really got a great record against Rangers. They haven't recently, Peter. I think they're 13, 14 games without a win against Rangers, which is unthinkable. You, you know, going back, even in Neil's time, even when I was there, we always we'd, we'd at least give Rangers a, a game and we'd beat them maybe once or twice uh, in a season or two. So it's a poor record Hibs have got, but they're in good form at the minute, Peter. Great result just before the break against Livingston. He's got a full squad to play, to pick from. Um, but the last time they went to Ibrox, they get tanked for nothing. Yeah. Um, so they've got to stay in the game as long as possible. Try and get the first goal uh, and see if the fans turn on the home team. But, you know, if Hibs go there and score the first goal, they've, they've got good players in the counter-attack that can punish Rangers. But I think the first goal is all important. And these games are all critical because it's it's top six finish and Dundee will be looking and thinking Dundee have got St Johnson. Yeah, so it's a great opportunity for them. You know, yeah. they'll be thinking you know Hibs will go and get nothing at Ibrox and we can jump above them again. So it's crucial that Hibs finish in the in the top six. There's only what three games to the split, so there's not a lot of margin for error. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, just before we finish, guys, um, I thought it was a lovely touching uh, tribute to have Sven Joran Eriksson in charge of a team that he supported, uh, which was lovely. He, the Liverpool legends against the Ajax legends, Ruffy. Yeah, I mean, it's always good. We know the unfortunate circumstances he's under health wise. You know, it's good for somebody who's been in the game so long, you know, and, and, and at a very, very high level that uh, he's still showing, the, the clubs are still showing their appreciation and wanting them to. Be happy at a terrible time. Yeah, a terminal cancer uh, for Sven Joran Eriksson. But uh, there was a, a lovely moment that he enjoyed as the Liverpool manager for a day. Now, how is it was? It was full of emotions, tears coming. Uh, it's been my dream club all my life. Uh, even when I had England, I, I was a supporter of Liverpool, but I couldn't say it at that time. That wouldn't have been <laughs> very good. <laughs> That's a great line from him. But um, there was a period where Sven Joran Eriksson was absolutely hot property. Oh, he's one of the best. I think it was around the early 90s. You Lazio, know. Lazio Benfica. You know, um, he's, he won titles there. 
he won the cup winners cup as well and with Benfica you know we had a really good team won the Portuguese league a few times and obviously it led to him going into the the England um, setup and I think he's got a few regrets like that it didn't really sort of turn out the way many people expected it to with that sort of golden generation of players there was a little bit of footage on on the show you know you had the likes of Beckham and Gerrard and Michael Owen, Paul Scholes, you know, all, you know, sending the best switches. You know, it was a great touch, like, and you could feel the warmth that the players felt from. Some crowd at Anfield for it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, Liverpool fans are amazing. And there's one, you know, recently with Celtic as well, and I think that was a full house as well. Yeah, incredible, um, and great to see alongside him, Ian Rush. John Barnes and John Aldridge in there, and they capped it off with a win. Although the one thing that interested me, uh, Ruffy, was uh, Fernando Torres back in a Liverpool top mm -hmm. scored a goal. It wasn't what you would call a classic Torres uh, goal, but he but he got it from about two inches out, probably Neil's favourite mm -hmm. <laughs> Neil's favourite distance. But yes, yeah, yeah, but it just shows you the, the the family club that Liverpool are. The traditions of the boot room and. You know, players past and present, every time they come back, you know, it doesn't matter if they're a big, big star or just a, one of the ordinary players, they get a wonderful reception. Yeah, 50 million, he should never have moved to Chelsea. I always think that would be terrible. terrible at Chelsea, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, Brilliant. he hit at Liverpool. Oh, Brilliant at Liverpool. Liverpool in Spain. You know, scored the goal, I think, won the Euros in the final, remember, against I think, mm, maybe, yeah. maybe Germany. Um, but just didn't work out for him at Chelsea, which was unusual because I think it was at Mourinho that signed them. Um, didn't work out for him, but at Liverpool he was one of the best strikers in the world. Yeah, and th th there's one player that I liked at Ajax that I thought he was a fantastic player. He played for both of them actually. Yari Lippmann, do you remember oh, yeah, him? Oh yeah, Finnish guy. Yeah, what a player he was. Yeah, yeah. He played against him. Yeah, yeah, in an international, yeah, class player. Yeah. yeah, if there if there was one team in in life uh, when you were playing that you would love to have played in, playing. is there a team that you would love to have played for? Uh, down through the years and the particular players that were in that team? Probably the SA Milan team. Good you know, shout. That, uh, either one, you know, the couple of like generational ones, the one with uh, Van Basten, Rijkaard, and mm. uh, Hillett. Uh, Hillett. Yeah. And then the, 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 large, the, the Ancelotti team with Pirlo and Gattuso and Kaka and Inzaghi and that, you know. Yeah. Playing there every week with them players, you know. <laughs> It's not bad, like, you know. I've got a great photo. Well, the Spanish teams weren't as strong, you know, in May year as yes. you know, the Italian teams, but <laughs> the ultimate team for me was the Guardiola team of 2011 that beat Man United at Wembley. Mm. Yeah, I was there that's to watch the, that That's game. the best club team I've ever mm -hmm. seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so AC Milan for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, that would, no, but I, I've got a great picture of you and uh, Gattuso just giving each other a little high five um, in a game. Uh, basically, bro, the only thing I can think of is the respect for knocking lumps out of each yeah, other. Yeah, I saw him playing. The, I went to the 2003 Champions League final at Old Trafford and they played Juventus. It wasn't a great game, but he was brilliant. Yeah. You know, he was fantastic in it. Um, and Milan won it on penalties. But just, you know, we had obviously lost a week before in Seville and I just went to watch the final, you know. And like I said, it was very tactical, very physical. And I thought he was brilliant that night, like, you know. Yeah. Uh, Ruffy, is there a team? Oh, probably Pele's Brazilian team in 1970. Yeah. Where the goalie would just stood a bit and watched, <laughs> <laughs> and watched the rest of them just ripping everybody to bits. <laughs> That would have been ideal. For oh, God. Ruffy just sitting in the goal, <laughs> working out his bonus for each one. Yeah. <laughs> Change my boots on half time. Yeah. Yeah. gloves. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Tom? The uh, Guardiola's team. Yeah. I mean, if you couldn't have scored goals in that team with Messi and Neymar, Suarez, you know, yeah. Iniesta, Javi, Busquets, PK, some team. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, one of the best teams uh, of all time. I'm sure people have in their each generation. Uh, one of the teams that they think was the greatest of all time, but certainly Ruffy mentioned there, <laughs> you'd be hard pressed to beat the Brazilian side of 1970. Anyway, we like to take a wee trip down memory lane, just tap into everybody's likes and dislikes. Hopefully you're enjoying the show. There's lots of good stuff uh, coming up. Straight talk, one-to-one -one interviews. We've got, of course, the women's football show every week. We also have... Uh, the journal show where, uh, of course, nothing better than four journalists getting together and arguing with each other. 
And as well as that, Kerry will be back with Tam and Ruffy for the Saturday preview show, as well as our team of experienced journalists just bringing you all the breaking daily news. If you download the app, you'll get all the breaking news at your fingertips and all our unique video content on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. Why not hit the subscribe button and join the football family? Hope you've enjoyed it today. Great to be uh, back talking about football with Ruffy, Neil Lennon and Tam McManus from myself, Peter Martin. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching.